Hello, this is Jonathan Zapp of ZappOracle.com. Welcome to the podcast recording of Beauty in the Eyes of the Phase Shifter. And this document podcast is very parallel to uh, the, well, the longer one that builds up the, the general theory is called the glorified body. Um, metamorphosis of the body. Uh, during an evolutionary crisis and, and the crisis phase of human evolution. And then another one that's very related is Avatar and the Singularity Archetype that also gets into a lot of ideas about being embodied and so forth. This was uh, written in 2006, revised in 2008 with some editing by Austin Iredell. On May 31st of 1996, a morning of intense intuitions drastically changed my view of corporeality, beauty, sexuality, and eros. This experience is described in The Path of the Numinous, and the intuitions of that morning are developed in The Glorified Body, Metamorphosis of the Body, and the Crisis Phase of Human Evolution, and that work serves as a foundation for the present reflections. In writing the following reflection, I use the pronoun we by which I mean me, but also the many others who have parallel feelings. There are some for whom the experience of beauty may be quite different, especially those who have been conditioned by pornography, those who view sex as reducible to concrete actions on the genital level, and those most attracted to the human form when it is earthy, explicitly sensual, and unetherealized. But I guess I should also add to this that on the other side of the spectrum, there are those whose eros is so evolved that um, they're not so much moved by the beauty of a person's form as the beauty of their soul and so forth. And that's, that, that's ideal. Um, but <clears throat> many of us uh, are very moved by physical beauty as well. When we look at a person that has numinous physical beauty, there are so many layers of projection, archetypes like the anima and the eternal youth may be evoked. But what we also project is the intense inner urge to be phase shifted to a plane of existence where matter is more animistic, more imbued with spirit, more interactive with psyche and transformable by will and psychic intention. Uh, a, a word that describes that is idioplastic. The suffering and anxiety associated with the present plane of existence are almost too obvious to be stated. Most of us are at war with time and corporeal limitations in many ways. The oppression of bodily circumstances that defies our will uh, ranges from a bad hair day to a crippling disease. When we see numinous physical beauty, we feel a soaring sensation. It is as if we are seeing the soul freed from its corporeal imperfections and metamorphosed into a perfect form. The soaring feeling of perfect grace and beauty may also be accompanied by a contrasting feeling of intense desire, which in itself may not feel soaring, but rather is marked by an enslaving appetite, a sense of incompletion, and an insatiable hunger for sexual transaction. If the beautiful other is related to us in a loving mutual romance, then there might be more soaring and less hollow enslavement. But if jealousy enters such a union, then the soaring too becomes a hellishly earthbound suffering. Many people at different times and places have described what I've referred to as the green world. And you can see another document slash podcast, a splinter in your mind for more on the green world. It is a world like ours, like ours, but phase shifted to a more animistic and idealized plane. We see some of that in Tolkien's Middle Earth, especially in the elf realms of Rivendell and Lothlorien. Inhabiting these phase-shifted places are immortal elves who are more physically beautiful than mere mortals. Their bodies are the uncorrupted manifestations of a divine image. On our much more messy plane, when we encounter numinous physical beauty, it seems as though we found a beautiful gem sparkling in the gutter, one that arouses our delight and sometimes our greed. It is as if a secret has been revealed that deeply concerns us, and we may feel the illusory projection that this beautiful person belongs to us in some way, is destined to be ours. If this feeling is taken literally, we might become a stalker, etc. The beautiful person glows, shimmers, and lights up in our mind's eye like an angel, 
a being that is human but phase shifted from corporeal limitation. What exposes this projection is a realization that the actual human, temporarily gifted with such a form, is still chained to corporeality, to the likelihood of sickness, the inevitability of aging, to fatigue and indigestion and so forth. But at the first moment of perception, it is as if they were Botticelli's Venus, stepping out of the clamshell, as if they were light streaming through the stained glass windows of a Gothic cathedral. If we could only merge with them, we would be complete. We would be in heaven. In other words, we project and interpersonalize our urge to merge with the glorified body, defined in my earlier essay, our urge to phase shift to a greener, more divine world than our own. We sense that there is a slider switch, and there absolutely is such a switch, that shifts the matrix from coarse and vulgar to more subtle and divine. If you doubt that there is such a switch, try the following thought experiment. You spend three or four days in a small cabin by yourself, near in your imagination, in other words, near a wild flower meadow in the Rocky Mountains. It is late June and the days are long and glorious, the nights clear and filled with stars. During your stay, you fast on fresh fruit or fruit juices and spend much of your time meditating. Next, you spend, in your imagination, uh, three or four days in a seedy motel room in Newark, New Jersey, watching pay-per-view porno on the motel television, drinking Night Train Express, and buying all your meals at the greasy spoon across the street from the motel. These two poles of experience give a rough idea of how much play there is with the slider switch on this plane. Circumstances, outer circumstances, bodily condition, emotional state, etc., move the slider switch. But we want to be able to move the slider switch even more. We want, sometimes, to be able to move it to a greener world, a world where we and the human forms we behold have the beauty of Tolkien's elves. Some imagine those with beautiful bodies, and by some I mean me also at different times, to be phase shifted and unbound from this world and long to be amongst glamorous celebrities arriving at the Oscars with flashes strobing around them. <clears throat> but it didn't have to be tied to celebrity. It could just be that those with like particular physical grace seem as though they are released from the, or soaring above the mortal coil. If only <clears throat> they lost weight, had plastic surgery, and were a wealthy celebrity, then they would live in a world of light and beauty. It is easier uh, to see through such delusions when they manifest in someone else rather than when they are present in ourselves, just as it is so much easier to see when a close friend is getting involved in what is likely to be a disastrous uh, romantic relationship, etc. When we see a person of numinous physical beauty, it seems as if they are made of finer stuff, as if a light were shining through them. Some of this perception can be explained objectively. A young person with a perfect complexion and glossy hair is an objectively contrasting form to a person with wrinkled, blemished skin and dull, thinning hair. Although we constantly hear that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and there is some truth to that, different people are attracted to different types, it actually turns out that there is wide agreement across cultures as to who is good looking and who is not. Studies show that photos of people are ranked almost identically based on looks by people of all types and from the most varied of cultures. Uh, though, of course, certain things like body weight, uh, the impressions in some cultures have changed related to women and so forth. Um, but a lot of it is just based on facial symmetry and certain symmetry and certain ideal proportions. Objective qualities of beauty have even been codified mathematically and has been shown that those consistently ranked as more beautiful have superior facial symmetry and proportions that conform to the mathematical ratios of the golden mean. And you can find out more about this research by watching the four-part BBC documentary available on YouTube called Face to Face with John Cleese. Human beauty is not merely subjective and observer-dependent. Some bodies are objectively more perfect realizations of the human form than others. But even a person who has such a body has it only on loan because unless they die young, a wise career choice for those who want to be like Marilyn Monroe, an enduring object of projection, they will outlive that perfection. But when we can encounter a beautiful person in such an idealized form, it seems as if they have found a magical secret, have drunk from the fountain of eternal youth, 
and in our psyche that person appears like a shimmering portal. If only we could enter such a portal, we would be transformed and released from the suffering of corporeal incarnation. If we form an actual ongoing relationship with such a person, however, we become aware of the temporal fragility of their beauty, and the suffering of corporeality will now include the suffering of watching the beautiful beloved lose the perfection of their divine form, if we stay with them long enough, in other words. This state of poignant loss was expressed <clears throat> in a perfection of words a few hundred years ago in Shakespeare's Sonic 15. It was written like all of his sonnets when, when Shakespeare was in love with an androgynous male youth, probably the most temporally fragile form of human beauty. Sonnet 15 is an impossible act to follow, so I will close with it. But I would like to suggest that the reader, after reading 15, consider the many ways and layers in which we individually and as a species, in our contemplation of our own bodies, and in the ways in which we behold the bodies of others, are, as Shakespeare put it, all in war with time. And on a misconstrued personal quest to reach that phase shift which shimmers beyond the portal of death, and also at the evolutionary event horizon of our species. Sonnet 15. When I consider everything that grows, holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth naught but shows, whereon the stars in secret influence comment. When I perceive that men as plants increase, cheered and checked even by the selfsame sky, vaunt in their youthful sap at height decrease, and wear their brave state out of memory. Then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you most, most rich in youth before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay to change your day of youth to sullied night, and all in war with time for love of you, as he takes from you, I engraft you new. Thank you for listening. This is Jonathan Zapp of zapporacle.com.